Science. Uh, welcome, Maria Cafarel. Hola, buenos días. Es Good morning. It's a privilege to be here. So thank you, first of all, for inviting me. My aim today is a double objective. First of all, to explain how fascinating science is for me and to try and convince you of that too. And also tell you that it's not only fascinating, but it also changes our life as you will see later on. And then in the last part of my talk, I will explain what Biogipudqua is, which is a health and research institute, and what is our relationship with uh, uh, vocational uh, education and uh, training professionals. This is my research uh, group. As you see, they're all very young. We are located here. For those of you in San Sebastian, you've probably seen this uh, black uh, building right before the uh, maternity building in the hospital. And our name is Bio uh, Gipuzkoa, before um, Bio Donosti. And I'm going to give you some uh, general examples from uh, recent uh, Nobel laureates. And then I will talk about our research. So let me ask about a uh, with a question. How many of you know what a PCR is? And if I would have asked you 10 years ago, would you have uh, known what this was before COVID? So this is a clear example of how science changes our lives. It's a polymerase chain reaction. And it was discovered by Caris Van Mullis that uh, had the uh, chemistry Nobel Prize in 1993 because of the PCR method that is used in labs each and every day. And in, not only in labs like mine, research labs, but also police labs or in, uh, food industry labs, all kinds of labs. So what is the uh, PCR used? <coughs> it's a two copy DNA, which is the genetic material of our cells. And it's very uh, efficient for uh, to be able to have uh, copies in a very efficient uh, uh, manner and very quickly. Why is this complex? Because our, our DNA is like that beautiful <coughs> library you see there. There is a great amount of books, each of one would be a gene where we have all many words that have to be copied perfectly with no mistakes. Because if we copy with mistakes, there can be mutations, which means illnesses. So to copy in a limited amount of time all this great amount of uh, words or a DNA um, basis is very complex. And the legend says, and I don't know if this is true because I've never talked with him and he passed away, so I cannot confirm this with him. But the story goes like this. Uh, this uh, gentleman had discovered uh, something then a trip in the U.S. in the, one of these very long uh, roads so to have this idea. So he stopped in a, a gas station, uh, took a paper out and wrote this down and went to discover a PCR. How does it work? I, the laser is not working, but you can see on the top that we have this uh, double chain. DNA is a double uh, helix, and one is a uh, copy of the other. So we uh, put heat on, both sides divide, and you see this small uh, part in black, oligonucleoids that will uh, complement to the DNA and will be copied with a discovery that I will explain now with no uh, problem. Then we separate this again, then we put them together, and that way we're able to have millions and millions of copies. How did this uh, come to be? PCR works with an enzyme, which is the TAC uh, polymerase that comes from Thermophilus aquiperus. Uh, so this started with an anecdotic event. 
this gentleman that discovered that in very hot water from a natural park in the U.S. there was bacteria that could live and multiply their DNA at these very high temperatures. That's why it has that name. And this enzyme and protein that is able to copy DNA at very uh, high temperatures is the one working uh, here. So from... Um, a fundamental uh, event or an event by chance, we get to very fundamental discoveries. And let me continue with uh, COVID uh, after starting with the PCR. And these are uh, Andrew Wisman and uh, Catalin Caricor that are the Nobel laureates uh, for physiology and uh, medicine. They are the ones that have uh, discovered and have been awarded for their discoveries re uh, regarding uh, RNA vaccines that most of us uh, have to prevent or to uh, uh, make uh, the effects of COVID uh, not so um, damaging. And this comes from many, many years of research in the lab, not for COVID vaccines because COVID didn't exist and was unknown. These RNA uh, vaccines have been developed for cancer. And in fact, uh, Kathleen uh, Carico has been many years in the U.S. I don't know if you've read about her, but she is an example of a uh, um, career uh, stopped in academia because 20 years ago uh, they said RNA therapies do not work. I don't know if you know this, but RNA are the molecules in our cells where the information is copied from DNA to later on become a protein. So it's the way in which life and organisms work. DNA is transcribed to RNA and uh, proteins that are the ones that carry out the functions. So what they do is to use the RNA of the COVID particles, and in the cell, this uh, becomes a protein, and that's how it works. They've tried to do this with cancer for a long time now, to take a part of a protein that was only present in cancer cells to introduce it in that organism and for it to work. But uh, Catherine, uh, uh, was told this wasn't working, you've been trying uh, to work on this for too many years now. And in fact, uh, she didn't get more funding in the U.S. And that's why she went to BioNTech that was uh, founded by this uh, Turkish uh, um, uh, couple. And uh, thanks to all these years of uh, previous work in cancer vaccines, at a certain point in time, because this is a, a geniuses, wonderful people that Mr. Marina was uh, talking about, that they say, uh, I, this is something I've been studying for so many years, and just by changing it, I can orient it to this other problem that we have nowadays, like COVID. And I feel very proud to say that Angela uh, from uh, Portugal uh, that worked with us uh, uh, now is in BioNTech, also working on this vaccines uh, against uh, cancer. This is a very example of a Nobel laureate, and I would like to give you another one. I don't know if you've heard about these two women, Jennifer Doudna and Emmanuel Charpentier. They uh, were Nobel laureates in chemistry in the year 2020 uh, because they uh, mm, uh, worked on CRISPR. Uh, maybe you haven't heard about this, but it's a genius idea. It's a very simple tool that also comes from bacteria, as I will be explaining now, to also do crafts with DNA, copy and paste, as you can see on the drawing. And we use it in the left to uh, look at a specific uh, genes. I want to know what this gene does. I cut it and look at what happens if I remove it or I cut it and uh, paste it in a different way. And it's been very useful in uh, genic uh, therapy because it allows us to uh, fix a, a gene. And this gene therapy has been evolving in this manner. A few weeks back, uh, we could see that the first treatment based on this uh, um, uh, gene addition with CRISPR is uh, used with anemia. And anemia, where there's mutation and uh, red blood cells have a strange or weird shape, and they don't do what they have to do, which is bring oxygen through the blood. So Jennifer Dudna 
I saw this on Twitter. I got the news through Twitter, now called X, I believe, that is very useful. And she said, I feel very proud because in 13 years, we've been able to uh, prove in the UK the first therapy based on CRISPR, which is a gene therapy to fix in those uh, patients this uh, gen and to uh, change it. So the CRISPR story also comes from uh, um, basic uh, research, something that I uh, really uh, uh, um, support. We all want everything to be transnational, to have a patent and a result on uh, society and health uh, very quickly. But you need to understand that to achieve this, we need many, many years of previous work. So if I'm able to convince you after this talk, whenever you have the opportunity, when you talk to governments, we as voters, we have to request the need of investing in basic research and science. Why? Because this is the image of the and we saw in the newspaper in Alicante, the Diario Información, after the Nobel Award, and they criticized because in Spain uh, they said that they uh, forgot uh, Francis uh, Mojica. Who is he? He is a uh, lecturer at the University of Alicante, and when he was very young, doing his PhD, I believe yet, he discovered in Santa Pola, in that area that you can see, and this is uh, Francis uh, in this same place many years later, and he discovered here um, bacteria, the same as the ones with the uh, hot water before, that they could live in salty water um, uh, with a specific uh, um, <coughs> capacity, <coughs> uh, like the CRISPR. And at the point, they said, why is he studying this? And now we see how useful it is. Fran Francis is not a Nobel laureate, but he's very well acknowledged with other awards, important awards in Spain and outside Spain. But there is a discussion if he should have also been a Nobel laureate. And I would like to uh, finish by talking about other Nobel uh, laureates. Um, that work on something that is closer to my work. Uh, when you talked about the four uh, sciences and nanotechnology, neuroscience, I would also have included um, uh, cancer research because the changes in cancer in the last years have been impressive. And in fact, immunotherapy, which is what uh, uh, um, allowed uh, Alison and Tasuku Honjo to be Nobel laureates have changed the lives of many patients. A, a doctor uh, in a conference last year, um, I said, well, Jan, do you really believe that immunotherapy uh, is so impressive? And he said, Maria. It is true that it's not something that we can use on all patients, but I had um, uh, patients with a, a very aggressive lung cancer that would survive three, four years at the most, and now they've been uh, alive seven years with the therapy. Now they have no treatment, and they are doing really well. So that is another example of how science can change your life. So. As I was saying, I'm going to uh, focus more on this because this is my field uh, uh, of uh, work, and I will tell you what's the progress in immunotherapy. We all know what cancer is because I believe everyone has had cases of cancer in their families and friends. And now we are really working to de uh, modify this uh, term, but we all fear the term cancer. And the most uh, simple way of defining cancer are cells that grow with no control. And on the bottom, we see a mass of cells growing with no control because the cells in our body uh, grow, live, and die in an orderly manner. They have signs telling them when they have to uh, grow, divide, uh, carry out a specific function. If you're a red blood, cell, you bring oxygen. If you're a neuron, you transmit uh, signs, but in a uh, order. But they lose control when it's a cancer, and this generates a tumor. The top, you can see uh, cell, cancer cells dividing. It's a very simplistic view of how that happens. 
What we want is on the top left, you can see a tumor. And I don't know the tumor cells, which would be the green ones, but many, many other cells in the tumor that have really important roles. You can see the different names of them. You've got immune system cells that have an active role in the tumor. The what we call support cells, fibroblasts, or those that form blood vessels or proteins as well, which are those that are in the blue, and the, they support this tissue. And this cancer isn't just the growth of a mass. What kills patients, unfortunately, is the fact that it metastasizes to other organs. So tumoral cells leave the tumor via the uh, blood vessel, then they go to a different organ, for example, lungs, brain, or liver. It's a complex process. And all these other cells also take part in the way this tumor progresses. And initially, the immune system exists to defend us from a tumor. And it's very efficient. It's been said that in many autopsies, there are lots of mini, mini tumors that are never detected because our immune system keeps them under control. However, cancer has mechanisms to uh, help these other cells play in favor of cancer. And that's what we call the yin and yang of the immune system. On the left, you've got the immune system. It's That's the good guy. It protects us from cancer. It illuminates tumoral cells. Because what they do is they present them T cells. I don't know if any of you, when you were younger, remember Erase Una Vez La Vida, Once Upon a Time in, in the Life. I don't know if you remember this. It's a Spanish television um, a program. These, they're the T cells. They're the good guys. T cells are there to kill uh, tumoral cells and viruses and bacteria. That's, why the, that's what the immune system does to protect us. But there's the yin and yang, because what the tumor does is it teaches the immune system to help the tumor because that's what the immune system does is it secretes factors and, and it helps the aggressive nature of tumor cells. So going back to what I said before, there's a very important gentleman in our field called Douglas Hanahan, who 20 years ago discovered and described the characteristics of cancer. And there are two of them that are uh, marked in red, which are very closely related to immunotherapy. Firstly, they avoid immune destruction. They avoid being recognized and, de and destroyed by the immune section. And the other is to promote cancer, promote inflammation. What is inflammation? Inflammation is what happens in our tissues when it, tissues are harmed. Either it's a virus or a cut or a bacteria. What inflammation is, is it recruits cells from the immune system. These cells from the immune system here come here to help and solve this problem. What happens in the case of cancer? The stimulants that's there that promotes this inflammation, which is a tumoral system, don't disappear because the virus is eliminated or a cut that we have on the skin actually heals. The problem with the inflammation in a tumor is it doesn't disappear. And that's why it ends up becoming a chronic inflammation, and that's harmful. Other examples of chronic inflammation include, for example, psoriasis, rheumatoid arthritis, and many other illnesses related to inflammation. So in this context, that's where immunotherapy comes into play. Immunotherapy isn't just a anything new, actually. If you look, it's existed since the 19th century. The first person to talk about immunotherapy, although he didn't call it that, was Virchow who discovered that in tumors, there were cells in, from the immune system. And the first person to carry out an experiment that proved that the immune system could act in favor or against the uh, tumor was Coley, who did something that he would never have been able to do today. He used his own patients and, and injected them with bacteria to try to solve their tumor. This immune system that was activated to uh, solve this tumor 
was good for cancer. But this nowadays you couldn't do, of course not. And then, of course, many, many other uh, different milestones. And I don't want you to read this because it's kind of complicated and long now. But actually, many, many milestones until you reach today. And this uh, slide ends in 2015, but in the 2018 Nobel Prize, it would carry on. And many other medicines that have been clinically approved to now cure patients. And there are many kinds of immunotherapies. This is a diagram which is perhaps a little bit complicated. It talks about the cycle of the immune system. And I'm going to talk about two things here. Which are the two things that got Nobel Prize for? Let's start with point number one, which is tumor cells. These are like external cells to the bottom. They have antigens. It's like they're saying to the immune system, here I am, they raise a yellow flag. And they, But these signals that they send aren't detected by the normal immune system, but via some cells which are the cancer antigen presentation cells in two. What the tumor does is it inhibits these. It hides them from the immune system. And the first drug that was discovered by James Allison are some molecules that you can see in the next point. And the, next, and the other pro Nobel Prize women, which is the Japanese gentleman that I introduced you to, what he discovered was in point seven when the T cells, which are the police officers, have woken up and goes and kills off the cancer, cell, cancer cells in point seven. This is like the kiss of death, they call it. The tumor cell is able to hide from the T cell with some signals which are called PD-1. What this gen Japanese gentleman does was invent a drug that targets or inhibits or joins these uh, signals to hide from the immune cells. This is the same idea here. In cancer, tumor cells on the left turn on signals and hide from the immune system. They are either signals that are present in the tumor cell in brown or in the T cell, which are the white police officers, as it were. What we now use in br breast cancer is that these uh, molecules, either whether they be green or pink in this case, they block or they hide or they prevent these communications so that they can't hide from the immune system. And this is basically what we spend our days working on in the lab, in biodiversity. That's what we do. As I tell you more, there are lots and lots of research groups. They're working in all different kinds of diseases. But in my lab, which is the breast cancer lab, we try to understand why immunotherapy doesn't work for all patients. As I said earlier, there are patients, for example, that have melanomas, renal cancer, and lung cancer that are either, uh, that are before and after with these immunotherapies. But with other solid tumors, such as the breast cancer uh, kind of tumor, it doesn't work. But there's something in uh, breast cancer that means that these drugs, these immunotherapy drugs, don't work. That's what we're researching. In the final minutes of my talk, I'm going to tell you a little bit about what biodonosity is. We're now called Bio Gipuzkoa. And what sort of research we do and why research institutes are so important, such as our one. What is a health research institute? Well, they're into their in research institutes that are part of hospitals. What we do is we carry out research that's applied to patients and we get the support from clinical staff, a very important support from clinical staff. There's a lot of the, our research that is carried out by basic researchers. I'm a basic research. I've got a PhD in biochemistry. There are also biologists, chemists, and we work all together with doctors. We're also integrated in universities. Our uh, center is a university center. And another important thing, we collect all the research that's carried out in primary health care centers. 
What's our goal? Our goal is to approximate clinical, basic research to society. The health research institutes in Spain are the ones that are up on the screen. There are 35 of them. And in the Basque Country, we've got two. Oh, you can't see that. It's a bit fuzzy. And in the Basque Country, inside BOF, which is really the Basque government's health department, we've got Biokibuzko, Biaraba, Biobizkaya, and Biosistemak, those four. And it's only Biokibuzko and Biobizkaya that are recognized by the health ministry as accredited health research institutes. It's important this because not only do we collect up research from the hospital, but also all the research in other districts around the Basque Country. There you've got nursing staff, primary staff that's carrying out very, very important research that can be applied to society. And what is biodynasty? I don't know why this slide's now moving for some reason. This is what our our area, well, this is what we look like. There are seven research areas. As you can probably imagine, I work in oncology, but there are colleagues of mine looking into neuroscience or hepatic diseases, infectious diseases, epidemiology, public health, bioengineering. And we do all of this with the support of some support platforms, which are really, really useful on our day-to-day -day basis. Just there's some examples of them. Well, look, for example, experimental operating methodological support. We're just researchers, but there's a whole of other support staff that's supporting this research, and it's very, very necessary. And how do we integrate VET into all of this? Because I can imagine you're all thinking of you thinking, and you're here because you're in some way related to VET. That's what you're here for. Well, in Biodonosti, for example, in Ibiza, in 2010, we only had two FVET technicians. We've now got 15. That's 8% of our staff because they're around almost 200 people working. And what do they do? Well, they're members of the research teams and they're also members of the support groups. We also have researchers that that collaborate with VET. This is Anna Yastui. She's a collaborator. And I think she's be, she teaches at EASO Polytechnic in clinical diagnosis. I think I don't want to get this wrong, but you can correct me afterwards if I'm wrong. But it's mutual assistance because she teaches, but I think Technica and VET also have taken part in many of Biodonosti projects because Anna, in addition to being a teacher at the FVET degree, they also she's also involved in 3D printing. What does this 3D printing do? Well, I've noticed on your website that Technica have got all sorts of 3D printing courses. It's a bit like, as Professor Marino said about AI, what it does is it prints life for us. I've gone to Tabacalera here with my daughters on many occasions. There are two 3D printers. You can print whatever you want. You can print a toy if you want. We can, with specific materials, print what we want at a given moment in time and very, very precisely. These 3D printers are helping a great deal, for example, in traumatology or in maxillofacial industry. Anna would be better at explaining this to me, but via X-rays or CT scans, they can see, for example, a fracture that needs healing. They can generate it in a 3D model at a lab level, and that helps clinicians design the operation that they need to carry out. And not only do we do that, and that's pretty complicated, such as like printing out a jawbone, but some even simpler things, but also useful. For example, I think Technica actually collaborated with us in the pediatric service. They realized that those children that have to have, when they're small, they have problems 
taking asthma drugs. They have to put a sort of like a gas mask kind of things. And so instead of it looking like a gas mask, it now looks like a trumpet. And so with these 3D printers, they've invented this sort of kind of a trumpet thing. So uh, now children are happy to take this, these asthma drugs. It's a really, really simple example of how just a little idea can facilitate the life of many, many people. And that's my final slide. Now I want to introduce you to Suara. Suara, in the last year, has become the most important person in the lab. Suara is a VET technician. She studied at EASO. She studied a degree in anatomy. And then she got a practical placement with us, and she stayed with us. She's our lab manager now. I'd say she's the person who's actually probably the most important person in the lab. Why? Because I didn't know this until recently. What did Professor Manara? She's a very determined person, a very resolute person in all areas. She's able to deal with the lab's budget, which is over a million euros a year. She organizes everybody. She provides uh, technical support. She manages our mouse population and a thousand other things as well. And initially I said to her, look, you see, the thing is, uh, Maria, all of you have got degrees and all I've got is a VET. I'm going to find this really difficult, she thought. But without Suara, I don't know how we'd operate, honestly. Suara's great. And I'd even add to the characteristics that Professor Marina said that in addition to all of these six characteristics of a resolved or determined person, she comes to us with this smile every single day. And that makes everything that she does so much better. I don't know if there's any time left for questions, but I'd like to say thanks to all my research team and to all of you for paying attention. Thank you so much. María Muñoz Cafarel, muchísimas gracias. Gracias, Sergio. ¿Cómo vamos de tiempo? ¿Pasamos? Ajustadito, nos quedan como dos minutos. Si alguien quiere lanzar alguna pregunta. ¿Has anybody got any questions from out there? Yeah, we're going to. And when I say um, throw a question out there, I can throw the microphone to you if you need a question. Yes, somebody wants the mic. There they are. Can you just hold it as close as possible to your mouth? My name's Alicia, and I work a network of regions for lifelong learning. And my question is, do you have specific programs to try to get VET included in your centers? Well, yes, what we've done is we take practical placement students. For example, in the ESO Polytechnic, We've got to find courses that are adapted to what we need. But I think increasingly so. By the way, I loved your talk. It's more adaptability than training. In the past, we were just biologists and doctors. And now there are more all sorts of people. So if you've got a course that you think we could use, just send us an email. And we'll tell you if there's possibilities of collaborating with us. Thank you. Thank you for Maria Munoz for listening.